I'm Ron Bolstad and I'm here at uh, Southern Oregon University. I have returned to uh, share a few stories, some background of my 23 years uh, here at the university in the uh, administration. Uh, I arrived on the campus in very late 1982, uh, spent several days with my predecessor who was completing uh, a 35-year career as the Dean of Administration and uh, we spent probably uh, uh, a week or so uh, with him uh, bringing, trying to bring me up to date on his 35 years of experience. This, is, this was uh, Don Lewis uh, who was very respected uh, administrator here at SOU. So big, big shoes to fill and uh, jumped into those sh what shoes I could uh, right at uh, January 1st, uh, 1983, and served until uh, the end of winter uh, 2005. And uh, during that period of time, I served with six presidents, uh, including two uh, interim presidents, and uh, as many or more uh, provosts or vice presidents uh, academic affairs. Uh, there were four of us in the core uh, administrative, four deans at that time uh, in the starting in the early 80s, uh, dean of development, dean of student affairs, uh, dean of academic affairs, and myself, dean of administration and my responsibilities were covered uh, the support services, uh, basically non-academic support services, uh, human resources, uh, financial resources, and physical resources, uh, the buildings and the, and the grounds and so forth, uh, security, parking, uh, the business office, physical plant, uh, and uh, the financial oversight of uh, a number of the auxiliary enterprises, including housing and uh, uh, the bookstore, uh, food service, working on the financial side of those with uh, Phil Campbell. Uh, I was most fortunate in that period of uh, over two decades to have extremely capable managers of, of the various departments and their staff members really carried the day. A very dedicated group of, of uh, classified staff and their supervisors. Uh, what we accomplished in that period of time could not have been done uh, with, without their dedication and I often said that uh, and very uh, openly said that when one or more of our folks, uh, our support staff, were on extended vacation or a sick leave or something, they were missed because each and every one of them played an important role uh, on the team that delivered the services to the faculty and the, and the students. Uh, the Probably the most uh, challenging portion of that period of time would have been the financial situation at, at SOU. Then it was, of course, Southern Oregon uh, State College. Uh, but uh, when I joined the administration here at Southern, uh, the region and our country were coming out of a recession. And uh, it was a very difficult time. Morale was was not very high. Uh, there had been wrenching decisions that pitted uh, academic de departments against one another, competing with one another to be able to retain their faculty and uh, their, their resources in the face of budget cutting. And uh, uh, so, the, as I say, the morale was, was not particularly high. Uh, we, we began to build out of that, 
to try to, with the support of the chancellor's office uh, in Eugene, to uh, make the case in Salem to uh, to support higher education in Oregon. We thought we were making progress on that as the 80s uh, concluded, and lo and behold, uh, on the ballot in 1990 was the uh, the property tax measure, Measure 5, uh, which passed and uh, of course is still influencing our our property tax bills today. Uh, uh, that that resulted in that the passage of that measure resulted in budget cutting in uh, higher education, severe budget cutting, and it really marked the changing uh, uh, a big change in the a proportion of the instructional budget that was supported by state funds vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, student incidental fees. Excuse me, uh, correct that, uh, tuition. Uh, the tuition levels we had, and my predecessor and others, the presidents of SOU, had wanted to keep tuition as low as possible recognizing that we have many uh, students at, at Southern that are first time students here from families of limited resources. And uh, uh, when the measure passed, we saw a steady decline from then on, then on uh, in the proportion of the instructional budget supported by state resources, the general fund. and. Uh, Whereas in those early 80s, uh, tuition covered about a third of the instructional budget. By the time I left uh, in 2005, it was, uh, tuition was covering two thirds of the instructional budget. So it was just a, a reversal of the proportion of tuition uh, to general fund in our budget and of course that put pressure on student budgets and uh, placed the student financial aid office in a particularly uh, uh, focus to help support as many students as possible with government uh, uh, loans and grants and uh, I must say uh, the foundation, our Southern Oregon University Foundation stepped up and emphasized uh, fundraising uh, to, to uh, fund scholarships. Uh, during that period of budget angst in the 80s and uh, well continuing on into the 90s, uh, again the foundation was asked to step up not only with the scholarship money but with building uh, construction money. Uh, the last, my understanding is that the, the last building in the state university system, the Oregon University system, to be completely funded, instructional building to be completely funded with state general funds was our theater building here on campus. Uh, from that point on, campus, campuses were asked to raise part of the money uh, that the state would not finance the full cost of constructing an, an, uh, an instructional space. So we were faced from then on with uh, major capital campaigns through our Southern Oregon Foundation. And they stepped up and the community stepped up. Uh, it was wonderful to see that. Uh, and not only in those years did they step up the community uh, with their donations and support of SOU uh, for major buildings, but also completely funded uh, the stadium, the new stadium, which was opened in 1983. Uh, the remodel of the Swedenberg House, which we, we now call the Plunkett Center because of a, a major gift uh, toward that project by G Gilman Plunkett. Uh, and th that actually saved the building. It was scheduled to be raised uh, and 
just prior to my arrival on campus uh, in the early 80s, there was discussion of that. Uh, and, uh, but it was saved and saved through complete uh, private resources coming to support that building. So the, the, uh, the Schneider Museum, another example of the community stepping up, Bill and Florence Schneider uh, making major gifts, actually two separate gifts that made that the, the museum possible. So when, when we were worried about state resources, when and where would they uh, uh, come from in the future, the foundation was there raising money to support projects which would add to the strength of this campus and its, its academic programs. I think another uh, story that, that re relates to uh, how the, the appearance of the campus, the buildings and so forth, the, the, the physical resources that are available to our uh, faculty and, and uh, students would be the North Campus, uh, north of the uh, railroad tracks. Uh, between what uh, uh, Iowa Street, bordering on Iowa Street, uh, out to, to East Main Street. This was in the master plan slated to be housing, student housing, and properties were bought on the general market uh, from private owners with the thought that the North Campus would be housing as the campus grew, the enrollment grew. Uh, it was, uh, there were only maybe one, maybe, there was one, maybe two houses at, at a point in time in the uh, mid 80s. And the President Sicaro, at that time Nat Natalie Sicaro, uh, was informed that the armory, the National Guard armory located on East Main Street uh, might have to leave Ashland. Excuse me, I correct that. The armory located downtown might have to leave Ashland because of its age. And with the thought that, that the presence of the Oregon National Guard would, would be uh, removed from, it, from the Ashland scene after so many years, uh, on behalf of the campus, Dr. Sicaro offered to lease the land, lease land along uh, East Main Street to the Oregon National Guard. And that was done. Uh, uh, very amicable uh, negotiations with the Guard. My recollection is uh, a 50-year lease for a dollar. And uh, so that uh, brought, uh, or c the continuation of the armory in Ashland, an armory in Ashland. Well, it also, it also prompted a, a look at the North Campus. All right, here's a, a public building, not university itself, but uh, a public building uh, located on our North Campus uh, might the whole area there be uh, a public service area for the campus? And uh, uh, the next thing that occurred that, that really reinforced that is that uh, uh, a local citizen, Ralph Winger, uh, out of Eagle Point, came to uh, Dr. Sicaro and said, you know, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is looking to site a major laboratory uh, in the country. And they're well along in the process, and my recollection is by well along in the process, they'd, they'd identified three sites, and uh, the process was about to be closed. And uh, through Mr. Wenger's energy and initiative, he brought, uh, Ken Goddard out to Ashland to look at the North Campus. And uh, Ken came out here. It was my pleasure to 
show him the North Campus. I recall we stood in the middle of a field and he looked at the 365, 300, excuse me, 360 uh, view and he said, oh my gosh, this would be outstanding for the laboratory. And through the work of Senator Hatfield and others, uh, the funding came through, the site was designated for the uh, Southern, Southern Oregon State College campus and uh, we see the history here of, of the Fish and Wildlife Laboratory, one of a kind, located on our campus and with close ties with the faculty and the sciences uh, to this day. And Ken Goddard remains the director from the, from the 1980s to the current time. So I, I think that is one of the most gratifying decisions as I look back on it that was made. Uh, so after that, uh, one of our uh, faculty emeritus, uh, or at that time, now a faculty emeritus, but at previously a uh, member of our biology faculty, Dr. Ron Lamb and Mr. Winger, proposed a, a natural history museum be located on the north of campus. So through negotiations of that, the, the building we see there today uh, was the result and uh, a natural history museum was created on this campus. Uh, the, the area there was designated the uh, Marco Hatfield Environmental Science Complex, thinking that there might be even further expansion of the uh, uh, sciences, the natural sciences. Uh, the museum uh, prospered for a period of a number of years. Uh, the, uh, the usage, the number of visitors, unfortunately, uh, did not continue to grow and uh, so financially uh, it was uh, not possible for that uh, particular entity to continue and after a, a bit of a gap in time, uh, the Science Works uh, uh, leadership came forward with a concept of leasing the building and creating a hands-on um, hands laboratory, if you will, for particularly young people, children, to enjoy and learn about science. And it's become a, more of a multi-use facility under their guidance. So. A uh, bit of history coming out of uh, the 1980s on that North Campus that uh, we still see in place today, the results of that, uh, those initiatives. I might uh, interject at this point too that uh, while I was overseeing uh, the support services of the campus, one of my uh, uh, primary uh, areas of interest and involvement was working with the Jefferson Public Radio. As it continued to expand under the leadership of uh, Ron Kramer, uh, I, the, one of my responsibilities was handling contracts for the university and uh, uh, property purchases and so forth and so uh, working with Ron there seemed to be a continuous flow of, of initiatives to expand the scope of Jefferson Public Radio and uh, it, it was exciting to work with him uh, frankly to keep up with him <laughs> it, uh, it, it uh, because it involved uh, uh, mountaintop uh, adventures, uh, weather adventures, keeping, uh, uh, keeping our wonderful uh, stations on the air and translators, uh, continual challenge from his standpoint and the staff of, of JPR. But uh, I, I was his, if you will, liaison uh, in, in handling contracts and, and uh, uh, 
including, I would say, uh, the development of the Cascade Theater in Reading, uh, which uh, was an initiative that required patience, uh, understanding of the community down there on the part of the of uh, Mr. Kramer and the JPR staff, and uh, they were welcomed in. Uh, they had a station operating from Reading, but when the news got out in Reading that the JPR wanted to uh, restore the Cascade Theater and uh, move its uh, studio into an annex to the theater, uh, the community came forth with open arms uh, to, to welcome that. And uh, it, it, uh, I worked with, with uh, Ron on that. I think that the, the most interesting, from my personal standpoint, the most interesting part of that, that whole Cascade Theater renovation and the eventual opening to the accolades of that community uh, was the fact that the, the major renovation, the re major restoration was financed with Oregon bonds. And nobody could believe this was happening. Uh, but uh, I can remember uh, sitting alongside uh, President uh, Steve Reno at the State Board of Higher Education meeting in La Grande that particular month when this came up on the, the docket that board approval was, was needed to make a request to the state to sell Oregon bonds to renovate a theater in Redding, California. It passed unanimously. Passed unanimously. Uh, Dr. Reno did a, a beautiful job in laying out the reasons for doing this and the importance of Jefferson Public Radio to our region which is a region that Southern Oregon University supports. And uh, uh, so JPR was off and running, work, working with the local leadership there in, in Reading to accomplish that. And uh, it took about 10 years for me to finally get down and visit that theater, and I, w I was overwhelmed. It, it just was is magnificent. Uh, Another story that, that uh, I, I'd like to share with you is that, is that of, of the transition from Southern Oregon State College to university status. And the seeds of this had been, were being sown prior to, much prior to when it actually happened. Uh, and, and the actual date that, that Governor Kitzhaber signed the, the document that made the three regional institutions universities, Western, Eastern, and Southern, April 1st, 1997. And he signed it in his ceremonial signing office. I was privileged to be there with, with Steve Reno and the local citizen who had a longtime member of our foundation board, Ben Tyron. Uh, ben uh, really kept the, f <laughs> the torch burning that this institution should be university status, should have university status. And uh, so he was invited to, to join us up in the governor's office. Uh, it's made a difference. I, the, the, the primary purpose, as I recall, was to appropriately recognize the mix of programs and degrees that Southern and the other institutions were offering at that time and would be offering, including, of course, the, the master's degrees in a number of areas. And that it, in terms of clarifying to the public, to international students, uh, other government agencies where we might be applying for grants to have the word university would be appropriate in, as a, a, in defining the role of our institution, the miss mission of our institution. So uh, that was a, a major step at the time. Uh, 
worth whatever expense to print new letterhead and new business cards because it it uh, really was a boost to this institution to to have that recognition and uh, we were pleased of course for the other our sister two institutions as well to be recognized in that regard we have always had a regional focus here at Southern going way back when when it was the normal school teaching uh, 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 preparing school teachers public school teachers for our, our region but a more, a more compressed region uh, without the, the the breadth of transportation and and media exposure we have now and uh, over those years, the 80s and 90s, yes, our, recu our recruitment expanded. Uh, we were not afraid to recruit beyond our region, in fact, into California, uh, out to Portland, beyond, uh, to the east. Uh, and we felt that the diversity that we could develop in the student body uh, would be very important to the strength of our academic programs and the student experience. So the, 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 while we still remain a major resource for our region before, because of proximity to high schools and, and families uh, in our broader Southern Oregon region, uh, definitely we, we expanded. Beyond that, we had our recruiters going out uh, Hawaii uh, to the west and uh, states to the east. Uh, Northern California, a big recruitment effort into those areas as California's placement of students in their institutions became more encumbered. That they were rejecting students because of the student uh, uh, admissions pressure on the uh, state institutions, California state institutions. We became a very attractive campus for those just over the border coming in. The students could obtain the bachelor's degree quicker because they could get the classes they needed. Uh, and it wasn't that much more expensive to pay out of state tuition. So uh, definitely we now see a, a very solid base, but I'm sure still expanding or potential for expansion in California, Northern California particularly. Yeah. I, I'm particularly proud of walking through the campus and seeing buildings that, that uh, were a dream uh, at one time when we would work on the campus master plan and uh, think, well, gee, we need to build a, a proper modern facility for, the, for our arts, an arts complex. When I arrived on campus uh, in uh, late 82, sat down with the president, one of the first things he said is, Ron, we're talking about uh, a center for the visual arts, an art complex. We've got our art department spread around in temporary spaces that are not adequate, but the faculty are making the most of it, uh, including uh, photography and sculpture in an old Camp White building. We need to move this ahead. And uh, uh, it took, that. now that was, he was saying that to me in early 1982, we finally opened it in around 2000, the year 2000. So it took almost 18 years to do it. But the building of the Schneider Museum planted the flag, if you will, where the Center for the Visual Arts would be located. And our master plan from that point on was to have us locate the, the art department in, that, in and around the Schneider Museum. So it took those many years. It took fundraising. The, the uh, Southern Oregon University Foundation had to, to, to uh, 
generate half the money, half the money. Uh, that commitment was made when Joe Cox was president. He knew that he knew that uh, if it, if we were to get that project to the top of the list in the state system for funding, capital construction funding, uh, we would have to raise part of the money. So in a phone call to the chancellor at that time, he committed our campus to, to raise half the money. And of course, we were overwhelmed. God, we're gonna have to raise half the money. Well, it happened and we had great leadership through the SOU Foundation uh, put together a, a team of, of folks to manage that fundraising capital campaign. And uh, they did it. It was a great success. Uh, the art, art department could finally move out of those antiquated, inappropriate facilities uh, and be the, the solid uh, program uh, and sub-programs that they are today. Uh, another example of the fundraising, uh, and there are others, would be uh, the addition to and renovation of the Hannon Library. Uh, that required, again, a, a major capital campaign on the part of uh, our SOU Foundation, and putting that before our donors that, that this is the heart of the campus is our library and we, we need to modernize it and uh, expand it because uh, of potential enrollment expansion. And uh, I am very pleased. I, I think of all of the projects, uh, that one came together, just seemed to come together so nicely, not without its challenges, but it came together so nicely with uh, uh, Bruce Motes was the uh, director of planning during that. For, or he was formerly the physical plant director, but we, uh, at that particular time, uh, became director of planning on the camp's capital planning. And Jim McNamara and others uh, oversaw that project. Uh, Sue Burkholder, director of the library, and, and her capable staff, patient, very patient staff, keeping a library open while hammers <laughs> were, were being used and a lot of noise, uh, keeping the dust out of the collections and so forth. It was a major effort, but uh, I think for them and, and uh, in retrospect, uh, the campus as a whole, it was gratifying to finally open the doors on an expanded facility and modern facility. The faculty, of course, uh, of this campus are the most dedicated group of people I think I've worked with uh, in those years, and I know that must continue today. Uh, through thick and thin, the anguish of budget cutting, uh, they stayed on. I see, I see them retiring, and they have retired in the last 10 years. After 25, 30 years, they stayed with the institution because they believed in it. They believed in, this, in their uh, role in, in uh, instructing our students, taking the, that relationship so seriously. Uh, it was so difficult in those years following, following Measure 5's passage and on into the 90s to go into collective bargaining with the faculty uh, with so limited resources. Uh, it, it, uh, there was a point where we couldn't offer more uh, money for s supplies, services and supplies. There, not, there wasn't, wasn't enough to cover the cost of inflation of goods and services that departments would, would need to purchase. Uh, we could only sell the value of a view of Grizzly Peak uh, so much, and then other institutions would outcompete us salary-wise. But I, I, I think that the, uh, 
the, the faculty saw that this, if they if they wanted to commit to student involvement, student success, and a low low uh, student faculty ratio, this Southern was the place to be, and and that's what tipped the balance in terms of recruitment. But uh, we always wished we could put more resources on the table uh, during the bargaining session. Very, very difficult times, and as I say, the, the faculty were, were made their case very strongly and effectively, uh, but there were limits. Uh, it, it got to be such a mutual concern of of the administration and the faculty leadership that uh, there was a point when uh, uh, Sarah Hopkins Powell was was the provost when we tried a new approach and that was uh, collaborative bargaining not collective bargaining per se but collaborative where we we went through some training as teams, our two teams coming together and, and training and together, uh, which the first time we tried that collaborative bargaining where we were trying to be as open as possible with one another. Uh, there were some rough edges, but it was starting to work. You could see that there was something to it. And then the, the second time we, we were met in bargaining, uh, I think a stranger coming in the room and sitting in on our bargaining session could not have told who was on what, which team. Uh, we were sharing information. We were sharing where there was possibility for movement on an issue, where, where we felt we couldn't have movement where we could make some trade-offs. And uh, I, I, it was so refreshing. Uh, such a difference from old-style collective bargaining that uh, uh, it, it, had I not retired, I, that, that's for, for once I could look forward, could have looked forward to the bargaining table rather than the, the, the past uh, difficulties that, that would entail trying to reach an agreement and try to reach an agreement uh, before the old contract expired. That was always the pressure. Contracts expire, expiring between the administration, the campus. Actually, it was a contract between the Oregon University system and our faculty. And uh, the collaborative bargaining really helped us to move that along much more smoothly. And I'm not aware today of how the approach that's being used in collective bargaining, but I hope that collaborative bargaining has continued. Uh, students, wonderful working with the students. Uh, I, my, my best exposure to it was it occurred after Measure 5 passed. About a year later, our budget director, Frank Seeley, retired. The president approached me and said, Ron, you know, we're, we've got budget issues, as you know. Would you take over and oversee the budget office, be the interim budget director for a while? And so I said yes uh, and uh, had a great, great office budget crew to work with, very, very capable. Uh, and so I did oversee the budget office for that period of time. Uh, we were started using, doing a lot of project projections, scenarios of, of the future. But during that period of time, uh, I had occasion to sit in when the students discuss the incidental fee that supports student activities. Athletics, at that time, uh, the, the child care center in Old Mill Village, uh, and uh, the, the yearbook, uh, student, different, different activities in the student union. 
uh, what a pleasure to work with the students and see how serious they were about their program, their individual programs they were supporting, how they worked together, how the fa student senate worked together. Um, so much maturity there. Uh, it was impressive. It was impressive. And uh, I worked with the athletic directors as they would make their presentations to the uh, student uh, incidental fee committee. And at that time, uh, particularly, and I think it continues to this day, the student fee money going to athletics is really their predominant source of, of financing. So those, those were very serious discussions to ensure the continuity of the various sports and that they'd have enough travel money and so forth. So that was one of the high spots, I think, of my time at Southern was, was uh, those few years that I had uh, the opportunity to wor work with very closely with the student leadership. Otherwise, the, the Dean of uh, Student Affairs or the budget staff itself would, uh, would meet with the Student Incidental Fee Committee. Uh, anything else that you can think of? Good relationships with the city of Ashland. I, I, another uh, high point for me is uh, the fact that the student town gown, excuse me, the, the campus town and gown relationship generally was extremely positive during that period of time. How, how did all that come about? Because we just heard from Claude Curran who talked about how <clears throat> the, the town and the community looked at the university with askance, with suspicion and somewhat of a fear that they were liberals. And, and so the, the 80s, with all this regional expansion, required cooperation, required mm -hmm. contribution. How, how, did that, how did that all change? When I arrived in the early 80s, I, I, I walked into a situation where I think that was prevalent. Not only was that prevalent, but a number of merchants sued the university, brought a suit against the university. Uh, there were in excess of a dozen, maybe 15 local merchants who felt the university was uh, uh, engaging in unfair competition in transportation, in craft sales, in housing, in catering, uh, to, to name several examples represented among those merchants. And uh, the, the crux of the problem, uh, the bigger, bigger issue funneled through that was that we were bringing elder hostel on campus into our residence halls and housing them, uh, the guests in the residence halls, transporting them to the festival uh, for the plays and so forth. And this came to a head during that, the recession of uh, 1980, 81, 82, uh, when the merchants were, were hard pressed to make ends meet. In fact, there were, when I was uh, in the community being recruited and, and w walked around downtown and drove around the, the community, there were boarded up stores. These were hard times for, the, for this region and, and I think more generally uh, the state of Oregon. And uh, the merchants, these select merchants came together, brought suit against uh, the, the Oregon University system and, and Southern Oregon State College based on perceived unfair competition. That suit extended on through 1983. Uh, it ended up at the Oregon Court of Appeals. Uh, the chancellor of the state system, I believe it was uh, Chancellor Bud Davis, was himself called to testify before the the uh, court uh, at the I think I believe that was at the uh, lower court level 
before it got to the Court of Appeals. But uh, he had to testify to the role of higher education in instruction, research, and public service with strong emphasis on the public service. And uh, the aftermath of this was that uh, each side in the case, when it was finally settled and the judgment rendered, uh, felt that it had prevailed to some extent. Uh, it didn't seem like there were particular losers because in the meantime, while this was moving, moving along and meetings with attorneys and so forth, uh, behind the scenes here, there were meetings with uh, uh, community people, P uh, folks that would step up and, and try to build some bridges with the, the campus and the community. Uh, and we internally took a look at our policies on housing elder hostel groups and other groups that were not uh, affiliated with elder hostel, maybe uh, alumni groups from other universities. Uh, and we said, we, we can change our policies. We should change our policies. And we did. And we required that if we were bringing a group on campus to sleep in our residence halls, they had to be here, they had to be on campus for instruction. There had to be a constructional component. So every group that applied, there was a form filled out and there was a place to fill out what is the instructional element. And that would end up in Churchill Hall for review. So it wasn't a delegated thing, it was, it had the focus of, of uh, the administration, the cabinet. And uh, uh, I, I think that our change in our practices, uh, no longer catering an event off campus for a public event, uh, I think that that helped to, to mitigate the hurt and the angst that was being expressed from the community. So a change, we, we changed our behavior. I think there was better understanding of, of the mission of a higher ed institution of our type on the part of the community members. Was the North Mountain, or the uh, North Campus development before that or after that? Uh, after it. After. So it really Je just after it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I don't recall when the Court of Appeals rendered its decision. It may have been um, 1985. Uh, the Armory decision was probably about 1985. Uh, Dr. Sicaro left to become president of Portland State University uh, 1985, 86, during that period. So it was just before that, that these discussions about forensics lab, natural history museum in the armory took place. So um, I'm, I'm gonna edit this out, this statement. Sikora was known uh, for creating contention uh, and polarization of issues and I'm, I'm editing this out just so that you know and I don't want you to speak to it but what I would appreciate you speaking to is this idea of collaborative collaboration and cooperation because I think that's key in how the, the transformation occurred and, and how the community became engaged enough to support the university financially so who were the people that created this collaborative approach? Who were the people here? In terms of creating a collaborative approach uh, during my time here, I, that did start with uh, President Natalie Sicaro. There, there were indeed some rough edges uh, with respect to faculty relations with the president, but uh, on the community side, 
the town gown relationship from the president that was positive uh, it was something to build on he 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 transformed the foundation board for more of a social group with very limited assets so you could say well it's a, the assets so limited you know it's a social group well as those assets grew the seriousness of fundraising to support Southern became evident and I credit uh, Dr. Sicaro with with building the expectations to, for what a foundation could be in supporting this institution and so he had key leaders from the community on the foundation board uh, he had po he developed positive relationships with uh, civic officials uh, they knew they that he would be accessible to them and uh, vice versa uh, so I, I had it, it working beneath that umbrella I found it very uh, I could very readily interact with the city of Ashland administrator uh, Brian Almquist Parks and Recreation Ken Mickelson school district uh, we embarked uh, in the 80s on a project on the North Campus to pave Iowa Street. School district developed uh, pave parking lots, uh, pave uh, Whiteman, excuse me, Walker in front of the middle school. We all had a piece of that. We were going to develop the athletic fields along Iowa and Parks and Recreation would manage them. So we had four entities in Ashland coming together to make something happen. And it was a model, I think, from, from then on of cooperation. When we need, uh, when we were uh, involved in a renovation of, uh, or a mitigation of, of uh, some hazardous situation in, in one of our buildings, school district office offered space uh, it, it was a mutual back and forth but I I think it was the the uh, tone of the president that the president set with uh, Dr. Sicaro and then certainly Joe Cox building on that absolutely had a foundation to build on and uh, Dr. Cox a very people-oriented, uh, outgoing individual uh, very easily could continue to develop these relationships within the community. And Steve Reno to follow him and, and uh, Elizabeth Zinzer. Uh, Ernie Etlick an interim in there between uh, Dr. Sicaro and Dr. Cox and Sarah Hopkins Powell after um, Steve Reno left to go to New Hampshire. But all of them very dedicated to, to collaboration with the community. And joint programs. And not only Ashland, but extending into the Medford area. I think that one thread through the uh, 80s, and particularly the 90s on into the new century, was the, the growing relationship with Rogue Community College. Uh, from one of early on what I felt that, that our institution was finding it needed to be protective of its students and, and its uh, enrollment and avoid competition with the community college for, for lower division coursework. And it took time to work through the discussions of the academic leadership of both institutions and the presidents to reach a, a point of comfort that we weren't going to compete head to head for students, that it would be uh, a collaborative relationship, that eventually we'd share facilities in Medford. Believe it or not, we'd share, actually share facilities. So 
uh, and, and now we see the results today of the higher education facility in Medford uh, that we share with, with RCC and the, the ease of transfer of students from RCC to our upper division programs. But uh, th those were kind of two steps forward, one step back for years until it came together. A lot of discussions, the provosts coming together and meeting and, other, and uh, uh, subject matter uh, leaders from, from the academic departments getting together and trying to coordinate their, their class offerings and their, re, their prerequisites and so forth. But uh, it, it finally just, it gelled. The, the groundwork had been laid, but it, it was being laid for a number of years. So collaboration there, collaboration with the Southern Oregon Historical Society. Uh, one time we, they had a branch in our Plunkett Center. Uh, collaboration with SOP TV. Uh, and of course, Community Access Television, uh, getting its uh, start and impetus here on the campus but with tremendous community support, City of Ashland support, very collaborative. It's wonderful. I, I, I wish I knew more today about the inner workings between the university and, and the city, but it, from looking in as a Ashland citizen, it, it appears to be positive today. The, again, I want to say it's sounding like there, there were just a few of us acting in these capacities with these various initiatives, but it, it took teamwork. It took the depth of our campus, the support staff underlying these decisions to make them happen. Uh, the students needed to be well served the faculty as well, uh, and our goal was to serve them as well as we could with the resources we had.